Melnor has been innovating lawn and garden watering tools for over 75 years. Use a relaxed grip watering wand to gently water delicate flowers and hanging baskets or an eight pattern nozzle for a variety of watering chores. Relaxed grip handles are specially designed to provide the most comfortable grip so you can get more done with ease. Find Melnor at a garden centre near you or on Amazon. Visit us online at melnor.com. Hello and welcome to another episode of Let's Argue About Plants, the podcast for people who simply wonderfully love plants, but not always the same ones. I'm Carol Collins. I'm associate editor at Fine Gardening Magazine. Hey, everybody. Good morning. Good evening. Good afternoon. Whenever you're listening, this is Danielle. You know me. I'm with Fine Gardening as well. And um, today, because of this special St. Patrick's Day edition of the podcast, our topic is going to be green plants. And I love that our producer earlier, we were talking about this one. Wait, what? Green plants? What isn't every plant green? But this is a special episode because we're going to talk about, you know, plants that really they're green, but they're not boring. They have crazy texture. They might have green flowers. They are just, I don't know, Carol, what are they? They're just fabulous, right? Yeah. Green overload. That's yeah. And, and, and yeah, special shades of green. Yeah. I don't know. I was, I, I was, I was kind of with Carrie, but, but then when I started <laughs> thinking about it, it's a fun topic. It is. It is. And you know what, like, you know, years ago we even featured a garden in fine gardening and it was a design that was an entire garden that was just green. It was simply green shades of green. And really, you know, your focus then goes to, the textures or, you know, the play on light, dark, chartreuse, which are all different shades of green. It's a very sophisticated combination, I'm going to say. But I mean, let's be honest, the reason we're doing this is because of St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> um, hey, but before we get into that, um, we wanted to talk about something that's super cool that's coming up. And that is a free webinar, free, 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 free. And it is going to be on Wednesday, March 29th. So just a couple of weeks here, guys, Wednesday, March 29th at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We're going to be doing a free webinar with Annie Guilfoyle. Um, it's called Finding Your Garden Style. And to say that we have been looking forward to this for months now would probably be the understatement of the year, right, Carol? Absolutely. We are so excited about this. Yes, Annie is an award-winning UK designer. Um, she has won silver at the Chelsea Garden Show. This is someone who I cannot wait to pick her brain virtually mm -hmm. through this right? webinar. It's so, so true. So listen, guys, here's the thing though, because it's free, you don't have to pay for this. You really do need to register because space is limited. So go to finegardening.com. We have a webinar tab that's right up at the top. If you don't see the webinar that we're talking about with Annie on the home screen, click on that webinar tab and you'll be able to register. And that just guarantees that you'll have a spot. I have a feeling it's going to be super popular. Um, gosh, I, I have several friends and relatives that are already ready, signed up. So go to finegardening.com to sign up for that free, free, free webinar with Annie Guilfoyle, guys. This is like, she's written books. She's on Gardener's World through the BBC. She's good friends with Monty Don. I mean, this is going to be very, very cool. Um, all right. So now that we got that business out of the way that we were, you know, Carol and I were jumping up and down because we're very excited about that webinar. But let's talk green plants, Carol. What do you what did you come up with? Because I'm 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 curious to see how this is going to go. All right. So I did a little trick because I went in and I looked and I saw what our expert he has a long list. Oh, like, he what does. did he even leave? What is left for us to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, he was um, an overachiever. Yeah, but we have this great database of staff plant portraits. And there is actually a folder called Green Flowers. So that was my <laughs> first stop. And Smart. I found some good stuff in there. And I also I also have things that I thought of from my own garden that I grow myself. But my first thing is from the Green Flowers folder. 
I love yeah, it. So. I love it. Full disclosure. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is Langstorff flowering tobacco. That's a Nicotiana Langstorffii. And it is a flowering tobacco that has green flowers. They are kind of a, a apple green or a chartreuse green, but definitely green, not yellow. Um, this is an annual. And so if you have grown other flowering tobaccos, you should have no problem growing this one. It's native to Chile and Brazil, and it was brought to the U.S. as a garden plant a long time ago, 1819. Wow. Um, yeah, so this one has been around, and you know, it sort of has like that classic cottage garden vibe. It's it's a it starts out with like a rosette, a big basil rosette of sort of those tobacco leaves that are in this case a little more elongated, so it's almost like a paddle like leaf. Mm -hmm. And it, it the seedlings start start out incredibly tiny, but they bulk up early in the season to make this big beefy rosette. And then later in the summer, you get this big tower, you know, the flowering spike. And it's covered with these little trumpet-shaped apple green flowers. They mm. don't have any smell. There are some of the flowering tobaccos that are pollinated by moss and they have fragrance. This one is pollinated by hummingbirds. And so it is. Mm. it has no scent. Um, it all parts of the plant are poisonous, though. So if you have, like, you know, small children that might, you know, sample a flower, do not grow this. Pets or, you know any kind of herbivores that you worry about. The deer, on the other hand, will leave it alone. Oh, darn it. I was thinking I finally have a deer mitigation plan. I'll just plan a ton of the Langzorfi uh, Nicotiana and get rid of my deer population. Yeah, darn somehow it. no, because I have grown <laughs> other other flowering tobaccos and they just they just pass it right by. Um, it. And if you're working with it, wear gloves because the every part of it, the stems, the leaves, they're all sticky. The so people mm. recommend this as a cut flower. And I'm like, okay, but wear gloves when you bring it in. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, gosh, I do. I think that that's a great cut flower. I think that's mostly like when I recognize it and see it most is, you know, when you're scrolling through Instagram or something like that. It's one of those very diaphanous, you know, really, really beautiful thin stemmed with those dangly little green trumpets. It's just it's that that little extra something in bouquets. That's just like awesome. Totally awesome. Awesome. Yeah, and that color goes with everything. It just yes. or whatever. It's just the way that green leaves go with everything. We're just used to seeing green with the colors of flowers, but it's just this extra pop, unexpected, I guess. Yeah. Yes. 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 So that's that's a good one, Carol, and that's a nice little annual. Now, um, I'm I'm curious if it drops its own seed and re replenishes itself because I know a lot of flowering tobaccos will do that. It's kind of like you know, once you like tall verbena, once you have it once, you kind of have volunteers throughout. Um, it will self-seed if it's happy. It does like some moisture. So if you've got okay. a good moist site, then you have a better chance of it reseeding. I think like for flowering tobacco, I don't leave it up to chance. I like to start it indoors six to eight weeks before the final frost, even 10 weeks if you're really, you know, going oh, for wow. the gold. But these seedlings start out so tiny that the... the it, it, you could fit multiple seeds on the head of a pin. They're they're teeny tiny. So, wow. yeah. And then when the, they're so darn cute when they emerge, it's like the size of a pencil eraser. This tiny little seedling. <laughs> and then you know you pot them on, and they get bigger. And and by the time the last frost rolls around, you've got something that you can actually put out. And then once they're in the ground, that's when they take off. But I don't count on the self-seeding because it's just too hard to keep track of those tiny seedlings. And also the self-seeded plants tend to not flower until like maybe August. And that's oh, just, I can't okay. wait that long. Yeah. 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 Right. Exactly. That kind of defeats the purpose of having an annual plant if it doesn't show up until right before the frost. Right. right? <laughs> That's so cool. All right. That's a good one. And I'm impressed too, because I also, you know, peeked in at our experts choices and they were primarily green flowering plants. And I thought, oh gosh, well, we've got flowers covered. There's not a single green flower left, but you found one. I'm impressed. I am impressed. Well, so I went to the opposite end of things. Um, You know, I think, I think primarily, yeah, 
I'm looking at my list. Everything is is a perennial and or a shrub on my list. I know, shocking. Um, but my biggest inspiration for this was we were out in Seattle putting on this really cool program um, uh, at the Seattle Flower and Garden Show a few weeks ago. And um, I went for a little walkabout. On one of the mornings that we woke up there and I woke up way too early because I was on East Coast time and I found myself at the spheres, the Amazon spheres. So if anybody doesn't know what that is, it's, you know, part of the Amazon campus in downtown Seattle and all around the spheres, which are these geodescent see through domes are completely amazing gardens that that time of year, you know, being in, in winter still, were just all tons of different shades of green. And um, I found myself really captivated by this one plant and it was soft caress Mahonia. Um, so that's Mahonia ubrichtiata soft caress, which is zone 6B to 11. This is a plant I'm familiar with, but have not grown myself um, because it's probably marginally hardy at best where I live. Um, but when I picture a plant that's the perfect embodiment of when you're trying to think of how to describe texture to someone, you know, it, that's a hard garden concept to describe. Soft caress Mahonia is the embodiment of texture. It just has this you know, crazy, almost bamboo-like palm frond leaves to it that are fairly long. They can get up to about a foot long, highly segmented. You know, if you're picturing a palm frond, that's what it looks like. But it's a very, very durable plant. Um, it has a tendency to have almost a stiff um, quality rubber like to those long leaves. So it really holds itself sturdy and steady and upright and just such it looks like it wants a soft caress. You know, you just want to go up and hug it or pat it down or, you know, give it a little pet like it's your little dog or something. Very, very cool plant. Um, and from afar, you know, in this garden that was primarily just different shades of green. That was the one plant that I zeroed in on. And you will see a picture in our show notes. If you go to findgardening.com for the plant list from today, you'll see the picture that I took outside of the of the spheres in Seattle of this plant. Um, it takes partial to full shade. So there's another bonus. So that's really great. Moist, well-drained soil. It's not going to be one of these Mahonias that if you're accustomed to a Mahonia that gets eight to 10 feet tall and wide, that's not this puppy. Soft caress only gets to be about three to four feet tall and wide. So it stays well behaved. It's a nice mounding shrub for you. Um, the stems tend to be kind of a cinnamon brown color. Um, but as if you think that it couldn't get any better, and this is a bonus that's not green, but Mahonia's flower in winter. Um, and they get these really kind of cool panicle yellow, panicles of yellow flowers that are slightly fragrant too. Um, and they appear in winter. Uh, depending on where you live, can be as early as January or as late as, you know, early March or so. We do have some here in New England Mahonias that we can grow, not this particular variety. And generally for us, they show the, the flowers show up in March um, when we finally get out of the sub-zero temperatures. So um, again, that's soft caress Mahonia and it's zone 6B to 11. So if you're in that in that framework, I would say give, give this a green, but very interesting plant a try. Okay, Carol. So did you pop back into that green folder again and find uh, something else that was pretty cool? I'm my next one is going to be one from my own garden. Oh, uh, but I do have one more from that folder. So that that'll okay. be number three. In the All show. right. Okay. But this one. So if you know, when you're thinking about green plants, I was thinking about ferns. And if you if you have any amount of shade, you kind of become a bit of a fern collector because they love the shade. There are so many different cool shapes and sizes and so many cool colors of green. And so like, I, I just thought, well, what's my favorite fern? And also which one can I find a photo of easily? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and 
And actually on both counts, Northern Maiden Hair Fern was the one mm -hmm. that, that came to the top. So this is Adiantum pedatum. It is hardy from zones three to eight. So if you can't grow that uh, Mahonia, maybe this is one that would be good. It's got, it is, it is another one that is just an amazing texture. It gets, it's not big. It gets only about 30 inches tall and maybe 18 inches wide, but um, it's just, it's got these fronds that are really feathery and some people describe them as palm-like or, or fan-like. It's just a shape that a lot of other uh, ferns do not have. And in the category of like green plants, it does have a few parts that are not green. So the stipes, which are the stems of the fern, are black or almost black in, when they mature. But when they first emerge, they're just this gorgeous shade of like a rosy pink to reddish. Um, it looks like, it's kind of weird. It looks like little bird feet coming up out of the ground <laughs> on really long legs. Um, and then they open out into the fronds. And before you know it, the whole thing is just covered in this gorgeous green, you know, it's it, texture. Um, great ground cover. I realized when I was looking at photos that I moved this one a few years ago and it totally never skipped a beat. It has just gotten bigger and better every single year, including the year after it was moved. So um, I think, you know, just overall kind of an unfussy plant. Loves shade, full to partial shade. Um, it will burn out a little bit if you put it in too much sun, especially in hotter climates. Um, average, well-drained soil, really quite unfussy and adaptable to garden life. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I'm a bit of a fern collector, but like if I only had to, you know, if the garden was burning down and I had to save one, I think this would be the one. I love maiden hair fern just because, you know, so many ferns I feel like have, you know, a very stiff, comp you know, composition, but maiden hair is almost like somebody very, very delicately punched out uh, of like green tissue paper, like these little itty bitty front, you know, these little, I don't know, pinules. Ferns have like all different like categories for what the different stems and parts of the leaf are called, but it, it, they're tissue paper. Like they're so, so delicate and, and, but hardy composition from what you're saying, like not, yeah, not hard to grow. surprisingly tough, but they do look yeah. delicate. They're yes, soft. Another very soft, soft. Looking plant, yeah, yeah, and I, I feel like that's just that's you know that's kind of going right into what we're talking about that you know with a green plant with a plant that is you know basically its claim to fame most of the year is that it's green. It's those textures or maybe even forms that you really zero in on and and you know, it's nuanced. It's nuanced. It is. Throw a green plant into your garden and then you'll be sophisticated. You know, <laughs> that's what I feel like. Yeah. And this one has a huge native range. It's native to North America and parts of Asia. There is a Western variety, which is yeah. uh, Pedatum subspecies Aluticum. So mm -hmm. like almost anybody can grow this one too, which is nice. Yeah, maiden hair fern. It's a winner for sure. All right. Well, I'm going back to the West Coast, but this is a plant that was introduced to me many years ago by the folks, Kelly and Sue from Far Reaches Farms, which is an incredible nursery that is out in Port Washington, uh, Washington just outside of Seattle and it's Hoquetia. Um, so that's Hoquetia apastis, which now because of DNA testing, has migrated to Sinicula as the genus. But that doesn't make any sense to me because the common name is still Hoquetia. So you know what? We're going to win with Hoquetia. Um, it's zones five to seven. So I definitely could grow this plant and I am not yet. But I think it's one of the coolest plants I've ever seen. It is just, oh gosh, how to describe it. Okay. It's six inches tall and one foot wide. So it's kind of this clumping ground cover habit to it. So the flowers emerge first and they look like a six petaled lime green daisy. 
that just pop out of the ground. You know, when you're a little kid and you're learning to draw for the first time, that shape that you draw of these little daisies and it has no foliage because you're just worried about the flowers. That's what this plant looks like. And then those are actually bracts. They're not the actual flower. Right in the center is a little dot of gold that, you know, is actually where what the flower is. But it just looks like these, you know, crazy Teletubby flowers. And they come out of the ground and you're like, wow, that's really cool. Early, early spring. We're talking when not much else is going on. So then this three-lobed lush green foliage emerges to meet up with those flowers but the flowers stay put too and those flowers can stay those bracked flowers can stay put for months and months and months so it's just this tuft of really cool looking green daisies that's what this plant looks like and it's lime green you know shocking shocking lime green with a little bit of a sheen to it. Um, so it's kind of looking like mm -mm, maybe you sprayed it with a little bit of, you know, shellac or something along those lines. It's an alpine plant. So here's the thing. It needs well-drained soil. This is not going to be a plant that's going to be happy if you put it, you know, underneath the gutter of your of your house or by any area where, you know, it lo it's low lying and gets kind of mucky. You want to get this guy up and elevated and get some gritty sand. On the flip side, if that's your natural soil composite, which mine is, it's a great plant that'll do really, really well for you. Um, it likes partial to full shade. And I'm just gonna add this as an aside. A couple of years ago in a nursery, I saw a variegated version of Hoquetia. Now that doesn't go with the theme today because that's not the all green version, but it is one of the most stunning looking plants in the world. And it would probably be the crown jewel of the garden if you ended up with this variegated Hoquetia. So, but I would say if you see either one of those, the all green version or the variegated version, this is a cool little plant to, you know, add to your ground cover collection. And it's just very polite, plays nicely with other plants and really highlights the spring, really gets you amped up. And I think you know, if at any other time of year it showed up, you'd probably say, oh, all right. But because it shows up when not much else is going on in that early, early spring month, then Hoquetti is a winner. All right, Carol, what's up next? Dipping into that green folder again, aren't you? Dipping into the green plants folder, green flowers uh, folder. Okay. And I'm not sure if this plant has been covered on the pod before. I have a feeling that it may have been covered before because it is a pretty common garden plant. But ladies' mantle oh. is a plant that is, you know, a great shade of green itself. And it has chartreuse flowers. So this Love is Alchemilla mollis. And it is hardy from zones three to eight. So this is another super, super, super hardy plant, um, at least winter hardy. It gets 18 or like 12 to 18 inches tall, sort of low growing and 18 to 30 inches wide. And so if you can picture the kind of sprawling across the ground, um, full sun to partial shade will tolerate quite a bit of shade, like almost full shade, um, but maybe with less flowering and average to moist, well-drained soil. So, you know, just sort of average conditions little shade and, and it's good to go. Um, I love the shape of the leaves. They are scalloped round little leaves. They have a little bit of downiness to them. And they're just like this sweet, soft shade of green, um, which looks great between other plants sort of or, or as a filler, like as, as a ground cover, a mass of it looks incredible. And that's the photo that was in the database that you will see in the show notes. And that photo also is in flower. So you can see the flowers and you can see my favorite and a lot of people's favorite feature when water gets on those leaves, it holds them like jewels, like these drops of water just glimmering on the leaves. And that's in the photo. I'm like, all right, that's, oh, that's, that's somebody that did one. good. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody I think good. that was Jenny. Um, nice. That photo. Yeah. Shout out to Jenny, garden yeah. editor at Fine Gardening. <laughs> yes. Um, I grow this plant, but I just didn't have a picture that was as good as Jenny's. And so it, Jenny's photos in the show notes. Um, yeah, kids love it too. It's it's a it's a plant that it's kids of all ages. Everyone loves it. 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, and it's funny, uh, like as soon as you brought that up, I'm thinking back to so many of those drool worthy cottage gardens from England that all of us look at, you know, Sissinghurst and the like that are just absolutely stunning. You always see ladies mantle bordering maybe a pathway with a little bit of nepeta, catmint, purple catmint behind it or something like that. I feel like every single English garden has ladies mantle in it. Maybe that's a, a question we'll ask Annie Guilfoyle in our webinar. Does it to be a proper English garden? Do you need to have a ladies mantle in there? Because it is and why not? It is a stunning plant. It totally is. And so many people can grow it too. Cause what's that zonal range? Zone three, three to eight. Three um, to eight. I mean, three to that's, eight. that's large. Yeah. And a lot, and some people, not me, but some people say this is a rampant self seeder. I would love mm -hmm. to have that problem, but I think <laughs> it's the moist soil. Again, if you have a, a mo moisture conditions, or if you're in the South, if you've got shade, you're going to more likely see the self seeding. Um, mm -hmm. For me, either maybe the voles are eating all the seedlings. I don't know, but it's it's mm -hmm. never really gotten out of control or spread unexpectedly for me. It's just sort of a nice, polite, every so often I'll see a seedling. That's awesome. That is so, so cool. There is a smaller version, which I have in my garden. It's the Alpine Ladies Mantle, which gets to be basically 10 inches by 10 inches. Um, the leaves are not as soft a green, though. I will say they're a little bit darker and the edge is a little more silver, but it still does that same very cool thing where you get those drops of moisture, the little dew drops in it, and it just looks like a little I don't know, fairy wants to come on and drink out of the cup. It's it's a great, great plant. Um, and green. See, kids, green plants are cool. Um, all right. Well, I'm going to go with a similarly shaped plant, um, ironically, and is a plant that I was introduced to several, 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 several long years ago. Um, I was surprised I, I didn't know it. Uh, Dave Demers, which is a contributing editor or contributing, excuse me, author from British Columbia, wrote about Bezia, um, and that's Bezia deltaphyla zone six to nine. And I never really knew about Bezia before. And after I got to know it a little bit, I thought, wow, why, why don't I know this plant? Perfectly dark, dark emerald green heart shaped leaves. Um, and we talked before about, you know, shininess versus not shiny. These are the shiniest leaves ever. They almost look like plastic plants. You know, they are so, so, so shiny. Um, and that, you know, that, that luster that it has to the leaves almost gives it a little bit more oomph because you can see that the leaves are a little puckered and rippled. So you really cue in on the texture that Bezia has because of that. Um, it's a mounding kind of somewhat creeping ground cover, but a polite mounding ground cover, you know, just kind of expands its little mound exponentially each year, only spreading to about a foot, a foot tall by a foot wide. So it's well behaved, um, partial to full shade again. So a really great understory plant will tolerate some dry shade too, which I think a lot of us, you know, you mentioned ferns earlier. That's a great plant for some dry shade. There's, you know, our great group of plants for dry shade. Bezia will also tolerate some dry shade. However, it does prefer a little bit of moisture. So that might be something that you need to get established before, you know, you throw it underneath an oak tree and call it a day. Um, it does flower. Eh, who cares? Like, I mean, it, it throws up this stalk that's a little bit like heuchera and you get these teeny tiny little white flowers on it. Pollinators, small like um, parasitic wasps do get in the mix with that. So, I mean, it, it's got that going for it, but you definitely don't plant this for the flowers. It's it's not for the flowers. And that happens in mid-spring. So it flowers in mid-spring. 
but no discernible pest or disease issues. And I remember Dave Demers hammering this into me and I'm like, oh, it looks, it looks lush. I bet you the deer eat it. Nope. Um, he's like, no, no, they don't. And I was like, oh, well, you know, what about the rabbits? The rabbits probably come around and munch on that lustrous foliage. And he's like, no, really, I've never had any problems with it. So, you know, if you're looking for a pretty hardy, all purpose, a little bit more unexpected shade plant um, that deer tend to avoid. So, you know, not a hosta baby. Go for Bezia. Um, and, and don't call it Babesia because I learned if you've added that extra B, that's a tick-borne disease. So totally different, totally different. Bezia, not Babesia. And Carol, I think you know this plant because I think you had a recent regional page where it was featured as well, correct? Yes, absolutely. On the Northwest Regional page, which I think is was probably where Dave Demers did it, but just years ago. So we, yeah, yeah, we, yeah. And in, I think in the June issue. Perfect. Pick up the June issue of Fine Gardening and see this plant in all of its lustrous gold, golden glory. All right, we're bringing it on home. Have we convinced you guys yet to plant some green plants? That green plants are, you know, not boring. I hope so. Because if not, Carol's got one more plant and I've got one more plant. So we're going to bring it on home. What do you got, Carol? I've got a big one. All right. All right. This is, this is a tree and it's, it's oh, no. a small tree. <laughs> She's going um, for it, folks. She's I going am, for it. I am. A lot of green. So this is um, a Norway spruce, but it is a cultivar called Cupressina. Mm -hmm. And that's Picea abies Cupressina. It is hardy from zones three to eight. I, I feel like all my things were hardy from three to eight, except the first one, which was an annual. But yeah, yeah I'm going for the super hardy plants this this time and also ones that have been in cultivation a long time. So we had a you know cottage garden plant. We had one that came over in the 1800s. This one was found in the as um, I think a sport in the Thur Thuringian forest in Germany Thuringi. sometime before 1904. Okay. And so it has been in the trade for, you know, more than a century. Um, and what is special about it, it, it doesn't get too wide. It will get mm -hmm. up to 30 feet tall, but it never gets more than four to eight feet wide. And it has this great habit. The branches are sort of vertically upswept, which is pretty, but it also have a, has the practical purpose that when it gets loaded with snow, th they hold the snow very well, these branches. And I actually, in the show notes, I have a picture of this in spring, in April. And then I also have a picture of it fully loaded with snow. And unlike a lot of other fastidiate, especially evergreens, which will ha have longer branches at maybe less of an, a steep angle, they can get broken or splayed by heavy snow. Coprocina does not seem to have that problem at all. Um, it's unfussy about soil type. It's unfussy about pH. It can take a little salt. So if you have a spot near that salty road or if on the coast or whatever, um, it will probably do just fine. Nice. Um, it is a a really nice shade of green. And in the spring, it's a little uh, more yellowy green. In the winter, it's a little more blue green. Um, but it's 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 a good shade of green no matter what season it's in. Um, I would say that young plants can look a little gangly. I had a uh, leader problem with this plant when it was first installed. So I'm not sure if it was transplant stress or there are... Um, bugs that can bore into the leader and kill oh, the leader. Okay. And okay. my neighbor thought that might be what happened. But um, in, in any case, the leader died a couple years in a row and it was having trouble sorting out who was the leader uh, <laughs> for a while, but it seems to have figured out there's one that is now dominant and it's starting to look like, you know, with that nice tapered shape at the top again. But for a while, it's kind of stumpy on top. And I thought, how is this going to turn out? This is I not mean... a cheap tree. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're talking to the leaders going, all right, you guys better work it out. This was not a cheap, yeah. this was not a cheap, inexpensive purchase. Yes, work it you out, can, kid. You cannot all be in charge. One of you has to be the leader. <laughs> Step up. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, but I planted this for screening um, on a property boundary. And, you know, it's, it's great because the canopy stays low. It doesn't die out at the bottom because the top is not shading it out. And so I've got this nice column of evergreen foliage there all year long. So I'm not looking at my neighbor's porch. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That's perfect. I feel like you sold me when you said that it's a columnar slash fastidious tree that doesn't splay. You know, I feel like that is a that's a huge problem, even through, you know, the, even conifers, broadleaf evergreens, anything that takes on that. I'm sorry, I'm going to throw it under the bus. All I can picture is sky pencil, Japanese holly, which is, you know, looks glorious for three years. And then as soon as it starts to get some height, that that fastidious evergreen just splays like there's no tomorrow. You know, it looks like one of those wands that the kids have at the car carnival with all those fiber optic things splaying all over the place. So that's awesome that it stays tight and bullet shaped. It almost sounds like I, I like that a lot. Um, and I never met a conifer I did not like. So that's another one that might need to make it onto my list. Carol, how long have you had this one in your garden now? Oh my goodness. I'm going to say six or seven years. This was okay. when we lost the, the boundary hedge that was between us and our neighbor. And this was one of the first plants that I brought back into the mix. So um, yeah, nice. I'm going to, I think it's at least six and maybe seven years. That's awesome. All right. So that's a good one too, man. We span the gamut here. We've got deciduous, we've got evergreen, we've got trees, shrubs, perennials. I'm going to end with a moss. Because when we were talking about green, the first thing I thought of was all the native mosses that we're lucky enough to have in, you know, the New England natural hardwood forests around where I live. And, you know, I didn't want to, you know, leave everybody with a with a native moss that you can't obtain anywhere or grow. So I decided instead to go with Irish moss, which I feel like is such a very multifaceted and universally able to be used by folks uh, perennial. Um, and that's Dagea subulata. Um, and it's zones four to eight. Um, and. I've seen this plant grown to perfection as in between stepping stones. I've seen it where I have it, which is um, on the edge of a container and it winters over year after year. I've got it on this container that it just kind of, you know, fills in the bare naked feet of that container and spills a little bit over the side. It almost looks like a bright green underwater algae. That's how I would describe it. These threads, these teeny tiny bright green threads that all mass together to make this really beautiful carpet of green. Um, it, If it gets two inches tall, I would be surprised. It is a teeny tiny steppable creeper. It will eventually mass out allegedly to about eight inches. I think that's max. Usually you're looking at something that's about maybe six inches wide. Um, and I actually discovered when I was researching this plant for this particular episode that it's part of the carnation family, which to me is really shocking and surprising until I started thinking, oh, well, Dianthus is part of the carnation family. And it's just almost a miniaturized version of those needle-like foliage that you get on Dianthus. So then it started making a bit more sense. Um, it can take light foot traffic. So if you do have step stones that you want to interdisperse with, you know, a, a lovely creeping steppable, this would be a good option. Irish moss um, also has a golden version, um, which is Aria is the cultivar. So if you match it up, I've seen it used to perfection in some of Courtney Olander, who's a designer out West. She uses them interchangeably. So you kind of get that chartreuse gold golden and then this dark Irish moss green and it ends up looking very checkerboardish and just kind of cool. Um, here's the big thing. Don't let it dry out and don't let it drown. Um, it, this is truly a plant that likes a moist, well-drained soil. So that can be hard to come by in a 
in a soil that hasn't been amended properly. Um, so in a container does brilliantly, you know, you've got that great well-drained, you know, kind of rich soil, um, partial shade, uh, not too much. Don't give it too much because then it kind of dies out and browns out, but then don't give it too, too little either um, because you don't want it to, to, you know, burn as well. Um, and, watch out for rot. Winter rot is a big thing. Um, you know, especially if you have, if you live in a spot with a lot of winter moisture, which under normal circumstances we do, but not this winter. Um, but if you've got a lot of winter moisture, you want this to be planted in a, in a spot where it's, you know, kind of burned up, hilled up, or has a lot of, you know, grit and gravel mixed into the mix. Um, so that's Irish moss and it's just, it's adorable. It's cute. I didn't mention its flowers because they're not green, but it does get this teeny tiny little white star flower in mid spring. That's kind of delightful and cheerful and, you know, just makes you feel lucky and like you want to follow it to a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. And now because everything sounds better with a British accent, here's Peter to talk about Kermit the Frog. When I sat down to work on some notes for this episode, all I kept coming back to was the Muppets. Tip with me on this one, I'll land the plane, I promise. I'm sure you remember that now infamous song that Kermit sang on the show in the early 1970s. You know the one, It's Not Easy Being Green. In that very catchy, albeit slightly depressing ditty, Kermit laments about being a colour that is so ordinary, so nondescript, that it blends in with everything. He associates green with boring, and certainly not capable of grabbing the attention of the flashy Miss Piggy. I think that might be what it's like for green plants, those varieties that embody only a single hue. Or perhaps they even flower green. They don't exactly stick out, so they'd never be a so-called focal point plant. They're often ignored, but I still find them intriguing. Might as well I'm intrigued by Kermit's huge five-finger hands. Why give that poor bloke fingers if he can't use them? With green plants, you tend to notice their subtle traits, like texture or habit, all the more. One of my favourites is Harquetia. It's an adorable perennial that forms into a ruffled green rosette of foliage. Then, in early spring, Chartreuse flower-like bracts rise up in the middle. The daisy-like flowers eventually fade to the same shade of green as the leaves for the entire summer. There's really nothing else like it in the gardening world. Uh, trust me, I asked the hosts of this podcast who confirmed this fact. It's a green-on-green -green masterpiece, much like Kermit's song. By the end of his tune, the famous frog comes around to being just green. I'm green, he sings, and it'll do fine. It's beautiful, and I think it's what I want to be. Well said, old chap. Oh, okay, I get it. The song, It's Not Easy Being Green. All right, all right, Peter, I see you. <laughs> you must know that song, Carol. Oh, absolutely, any child of the 70s knows that song. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's check in with our expert, Mark Dwyer from the Midwest and see if, you know, he's got green plants and if he knows Kermit the Frog song. Hi there. My name's Mark Dwyer. I'm the garden manager at the Edgerton Hospital and Health Services Healing Garden in Wisconsin. Prior to this, I was the director of horticulture at Rotary Botanical Gardens in Janesville, Wisconsin. Today, I'm here to talk to you about green flowers in the landscape, which may, might seem like an odd topic, but I've run across some really wonderful plants where the contribution of, of green flowers uh, is beautiful in terms of its compositional value as well as how it pops in the landscape. So I'd like to run through a couple of thoughts with you here. There's certainly many annuals that offer green in the landscape, and one of my favorites uh, is amaranth. There's actually a uh, Love Lies Bleeding, one of the taller amaranths. Uh, two varieties, one called green tails and the other viridis. And these have long ropey tassels of very textural soft flowers. So four to five foot in the landscape with this arcing mass of lime green flowers. Very beautiful. And in that same family, celosias, also seasonal plants, uh, many green varieties, many of which are promoted actually for the cut flower industry. In the uh, crested or coxcomb type celosias, two of my favorites include act green, and the other is spring green, and these both have sort of that brain-like, felty, velvety texture to them. Absolutely beautiful in the landscape, but usually under about 18 inches in height. For a little more height, though, the plume celosias, those with, again, a very soft flower, but very upright, feathery plumage in terms of flowers. The varieties Sunday green and sylphid 
or two that I enjoy for their contribution of that real chartreuse lime color. So dynamic in the landscape. Uh, one of the most popular annuals, and I call it an annual, it could be a short-lived perennial, but uh, I've always grown it as an annual, is the green ball dianthus. So this green ball dianthus is actually termed a sweet william type dianthus, but it's one of the most unique flowers you'll ever see. There's these two to three inch diameter spheres of apple green, very uh, velvety in terms of texture, but excellent in both dried and, and fresh arrangements. And I've seen them used uh, in bedding schemes and also in containers. So again, green ball dianthus. Consider its use as an annual, uh, really dynamic. And of course, who would be without Bells of Ireland for another annual offering green in the landscape? Interestingly enough, Bells of Ireland are native to Syria and Turkey, and the flowers are actually s small and very white, but they're held in a calyces or calyx that is like this inverted green shell. So if, if you've ever seen Bells of Ireland, you see these columnar um, stalks with all these green bell-shaped structures. The calyces are what are offering interest. And Bells of Ireland has a long history as a cut flower as well. It does recede a little bit. You need to know that. So keep in mind its location. I have a patch of it on the side of my house I've had for 20 years, and I just let it kind of regenerate. So kind of a, kind of a fun annual. Two more annuals that offer green in the landscape are in the uh, aster family, very daisy-like in appearance. Uh, in terms of zinnias, uh, queen lime is an excellent double zinnia, uh, two to three feet tall with just a beautiful lime green flower. Uh, this replaces uh, green envy was really the... Um, um, one of the best for many years, but uh, queen lime is really front and center in terms of very symmetrical, consistent flowering. And also, again, in that, that daisy family, there's a brand new Rudbeckia out called August Forest. And this really should be considered an annual for most of us, but has a dark cone in the center and ultimately green petals, ray florets coming out. So really uh, an interesting look with a, with a dark center and the lime green. In terms of perennials, I'm a huge fan of, of the green uh, cone flowers, and there's a variety called Green Jewel, which is a Echinacea purpurea. This is a selection of purple cone flower, uh, but it has this beautiful lime green coloration, uh, ultimately forming a very symmetrical compact plant, about 24 inches tall. The flowers are quite large, almost four inches in diameter, uh, slightly fragrant. Uh, which is interesting as well. But one of those plants that really pops in the landscape was combined with pinks and maroons and other colors where this lime green of, of green jewel really, really is uh, quite conspicuous and beautiful. And another variety of coneflower, green envy, uh, is, is beautiful as well. And what's interesting is uh, the, the green petals come out the cone, which starts green, the center, as, as that starts to darken, you start to see hints of pink on the petals. So it's really kind of a bicolor look with very light pastel pink and lime green. So again, green envy. When we get into shrubs, um, I, I keep going back to limelight panicled hydrangea, which has been out for many, many years. And this is a, a woody shrub that can get quite large. But those beautiful summer flowers emerge a lime green and stay a consistent lime green until they transition through um, a white into a pink. And with developments in, in limelight and panicled hydrangeas in general, there are some other opportunities for, for green in that species. Uh, little lime is a selection only about five feet tall. And, you know, back to limelight, I've seen limelight get eight, 10, 12 feet tall. So little lime in that five to six foot range. And there's now one called uh, little lime punch, which offers the lime coloration, but a really nice degree of pink. And all three of these, uh, whether it's uh, limelight, little lime, or little lime punch do end up going to the pink phase later in the summer. So that's something to keep in mind, but their contributions of lime are spectacular in the garden. So, you know, rethink green flowers in your landscape. Uh, they can supplement what you're already doing. They can become focal points. And we all hear that green is a color too. Well, of course it is, but when we talk about green flowers, some might look at it as a novelty, but I look at them as indispensable in the landscape. Happy gardening, everyone. Well, it couldn't be a green plant episode on St. Patrick's Day and not mention Bells of Ireland. I mean, thank goodness we had Mark, right? Oh, yeah. And how many did he have? That was a lot of plants. Great job, Mark. <laughs> that was a lot of plants. And he's been the gamut, man. He gave us annuals. He gave us a shrub. So, yeah, well done, Mark. If you want to see pictures of Mark's plants and all of the plants that we talked about, go to our show notes because you can never get too much green, especially on St. Patrick's Day. 